Thank you, gentlemen. And so everyone has an idea. That was the opening statements. Uh, we have an idea of where everyone's coming from, what they're going to say. And I'm sure you guys have some questions in your mind. We ask that you please hold them. Um, and now we'll have the, uh, we'll call on the volunteers to start going through and uh, handing out some papers. You guys can get down your questions on, uh, on paper, get your thoughts on paper if we haven't already started to do that. And we will, as we're getting our computers set up, um, we will... All right, so our computers are set up, technology is working for us, and uh, we will have Samuel rear with his response for 10 minutes. Well, thank you for that, Shabir. And uh, again, it's an honor to be with you here tonight and to be able to respond to these. So I'll, I want to look at your points that you made, go through them one by one. Firstly, you were saying that in Islam, there is one God, and I certainly want to agree with that, but as I've pointed out, and I'm sure you'll pick up in the rebuttal, I think that the Quran has Jesus doing what only God can do, and the Holy Spirit as the breath of God. And so I still see that this element of the, the Christian understanding is there in the Quran. You said that for the Old Testament, um, it was a simple matter of Yahweh is God, like in Islam. Well, I'm afraid that's not the case. I showed you how in the Old Testament the Spirit of God is God's breath and his divine agent into the world and that God has angels but he also has his own divine agent and that God's plan is actually to dwell with his people. And so God, there is this unity and distinction, this unity and diversity within the Old Testament. It is there. The Old Testament never puts forward God as an absolute oneness. Never puts forward God as oneness. There's a unity and a distinction. Now, moving on to God in the New Testament, uh, you're saying that Paul was the one who made the shift and he included Jesus in the Shema. I would say that Jesus made the shift and that the apostles' encounter with Jesus made them say, this is God's divine agent. This is the one who shares in the fullness of God and is one with God. And so they see that this is how God now reveals the Shema to us in the incarnation of Jesus. And again, this is part of God's unity and his distinction. You spent most of your time, though, looking at uh, the New Testament and its development. And so I want to look at a few of these references here. First of all, I've got a table which I made up for a previous debate where I've got Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And uh, I really just want to knock on the head this idea that the Gospels develop. Uh, I'm going to put, tease this out, but they actually don't. They have the same elements expressed with different emphases all the way through them. So they all say that Jesus and John fulfill Isaiah 40 and the coming of the Lord. They all have Jesus crucified, died and was raised again. They all have Jesus as the Son of God, the Son of Man, Teacher, Lord, Sacrifice and Messiah. There is an immense unity to the synoptic gospel, to all the gospels, which people tend to dismiss. Now, the evidence that you gave was of uh, from Mark's gospel, where Jesus gives the Shema in Mark chapter 12, where Jesus says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." And you put forward this as evidence that uh, Jesus was just teaching simple Jewish monotheism uh, at that point. But then this develops into John's gospel. But uh, I just want to encourage you to keep reading in Mark chapter 12 to the very next account that happens. Yes, Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he goes on to quote Psalm 110 to say, Yes, God is one. But then he brings out the distinction and the diversity and says, and then uh, he quotes Psalm 110, which talks about uh, the son of David sitting at the right hand of God, that, that David himself calls Lord. And then he says, how can this Messiah be the son of David if, he's, if David himself calls him Lord? He, he, is, he is greater than David. He is different to David. And so Jesus puts himself in as this divine son at God's right hand, not of a human ancestry, but beyond that uh, in Mark's gospel. And so Mark's gospel, uh, again, uh, Mark and the, synop sorry, the synoptic gospels and John are certainly different, but they're teaching the same thing. One of the characteristics of Matthew, Mark and Luke is that Jesus does not speak as much as he does in John's Gospel. 
In John, it's much more the dialogue of Jesus recorded, where Jesus explains things. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he demonstrates them. But he's demonstrating exactly the same things. That they're both teaching exactly the same message, just in a different way. And so uh, I'm actually glad that we've got these different synoptic accounts. Uh, and I hope that Muslims don't see the synoptic accounts as a negative thing, because early within Islam's history, there were synoptic gospels, collections made by the different companions of Muhammad. And one of these uh, gospels was kept, sorry, one of these Qurans, these synoptic Qurans, uh, there were synoptic Qurans made by uh, Ibn Abbas, Abdullah Ibn Masud, Ubay Ibn Kaab, and one of these collections was made the standard one. But there were synoptic Qurans early in Is uh, Islam's history. I actually think Christians are better off for having preserved all of the gospel accounts rather than just having kept one. I think if we just got rid of all of them and just kept one, it may have made something simpler, but I think we're all the, we would be poorer if we had actually done that. Now, you spoke about the creeds developing, and uh, I, I want to say the creeds don't develop. They don't develop. What development would look like would be something like Jesus is a man, Jesus is an angel, and Jesus is God. There'd be some type of development along that line. But that's not what we have. From the very beginning of the, the first creed, we have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Father, Son, Spirit, it's there all, all the way through the creeds. And in the, the first creed, Jesus is spoken of not just as a generic son, in a metaphorical sense of which anyone could be called and has been called in the Old Testament. No, Jesus is spoken of as the only son. He's spoken of as the only son in the very first creed. Now, what the creeds do is that you'll, you'll notice they actually unpack what it means for Jesus to be the only son. Because to say he's the only son is one thing, but what, what does that mean? Well, they unpack what it means in the Nicene Creed. They, they explain what it means for him to be a man in the Chalcedonian definition. And then they bring it all together in the, um, in the what's the last one called? The, the, the Athanasian Creed. But I want to say that there is no development. There is an unpacking. And it's, it's right there from the beginning. Now, you, you, you also put forward evidence for, for the creeds and this early development from the book of Acts, where you were saying that in Acts, the apostles say that uh, Jesus is uh, a man testified to you by the miracles that God worked in him. But that, that's only part of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3, verse 15, it says, uh, the, the, Peter is speaking again, and he says, you killed the author of life. And so Jesus is also called the author of life. Who's the author of life? Well, you know, this is what we believe as Christians. We believe that Jesus is fully man and fully God. And we find this testimony throughout the scriptures. Now, you're saying that the, the Jews and Muslims agree. Well, I guess we, we all agree with certain things, but certainly the, the Jews have a strong doctrine of the image of God which is not that strong, if at all, in Islam. Uh, the Jews have the idea of God dwelling with his people. They have the idea of the fatherhood and the son of God. They have the idea of the priesthood and the sacrifice of atonement to approach God. So I, I really don't think that Jews and Muslims have much in common. Uh, maybe they have as much in common as Baha'is do. I mean, Baha'is believe the prophets. They believe in Muhammad, don't they? They believe everything Baha'i Allah tells them about Muhammad. But you'd want to say, no, there's got to be a bit more to it than that. So just to finish up with what I was saying, uh, just to give a summary of my talk, I tried to show the big sweep of the prophets and that throughout the prophets we see that God has unity and distinction. He, he has his agents into creation, which are himself being his own agent, the agent of the Holy Spirit and the agent of his own divine image, and that this comes to its final revelation with Jesus in the gospel. And so Christians have this, this unity and distinction of God that they hold together in the doctrine of the Trinity. I've also showed that the doctrine of Tawhid has a number of significant issues it has to deal with because absolute Tawhid leads to God being, um, it leads to God being uh, a, a, a what rather than a who. Absolute Tawhid leads to God being unknowable and absolute Tawhid ends up making no distinction between God and creation. And so we need to have some type of uh, explanation there. Now, I've still got one minute left. Still one minute left. Um, 
I'll come back to how God can be three in one in a moment. I think I'll, I'll leave it there. That'll do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel. And now we will have Dr. Shabir Ali for his response. So thank you, uh, Reverend uh, Samuel, for that uh, interesting uh, response to my presentation. Uh, let me respond to yours, if you don't mind. Okay. Now, thinking about uh, Tawheed, uh, you, you said that uh, in, uh, Muslims deny the diversity of God. Uh, I, I don't believe it is the right position for Muslims to start by denying things about God. We affirm what the scripture says, and then we remain silent about what we do not know. So there are mysteries about God, to be sure. And, uh, and uh, people who do not believe in God can ask us more troubling questions and, and present more mysteries about God. For example, atheists may ask us, is God big enough uh, or strong enough to build a rock so huge that he himself cannot lift it? So that becomes a puzzle now, a quandary. But, but uh, having a quandary or a puzzle about God does not give us the license to go invent more things about God. And uh, my presentation actually uh, seemed to indicate, well intended to indicate, I hope the point has been made, that the, the, the belief that Jesus is God and that God is a trinity is an evolved belief. Uh, so this was without authority from God. And now when this belief becomes uh, questionable or puzzling, uh, you cannot revert back to the idea, oh, well, it's just a revelation because we know that it wasn't a revelation, it is a later uh, invention. So now, if we are asked about the essence of God, actually the Tawheed has been explained by our Muslim scholars under three heads. Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, and Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. So when... Uh, uh, Reverend Samuel was speaking about the Tawheed of essence. Uh, it doesn't fit in one, one of these categories. Uh, we, we know that there is only one God, uh, and, uh, and that's all we're going to subscribe to. There is only one God. Yes, the Tawheed of attributes, as he mentioned, fits under Asma Wasifat. So this does not present a problem for us. Uh, what he said in his opening speech about Tawheed, uh, to me, is not problematic at all. Now, he raised some other uh, questions about uh, the Muslim uh, scripture. It is clear that in the Quran, uh, Jesus, uh, God is described as uh, one who cannot be seen by people in this world, but then at the same time it says on the day of judgment, uh, so the, the, uh, uh, the faces will be uh, looking forward towards him on, on that day. Uh, perhaps the point is that we cannot see with these eyes that we have, but with this spiritual vision that we will have in the life hereafter, we'll be able to look upon God, and Allah knows best. Again, there is a mystery here about God, but that doesn't give us the license to go and uh, invent things. What about the mention of the Spirit of God? Well, the, the, in, it's true that in Hebrew, the uh, term uh, which is translated as spirit, ruach, uh, can mean spirit, but it can also mean breath. Uh, but for Samuel to make the same point about the Arabic word ruh, uh, he has to show us where he gets that from, to say that this is the breath of God being spoken about in the, in the Quran. Uh, the simple translation of the Quranic passages in question is that God uh, breathed into uh, Adam of his spirit, min ruhih. Uh, we don't have that translation as his breath, as far as I know. And again, I, I need to learn more about the Arabic language, but the onus is on Samuel uh, to tell us where he got that from. Similarly, when the uh, spirit comes to Mary, and that is something uh, that, that uh, Muslim scholars say, the spirit of God is min, uh, min amri. It, it is uh, from the command of God. Uh, so what does it mean, the Spirit of God? Or sometimes we speak about the Book of God. It doesn't mean that the Book is somehow part, part God. Or the Quran mentions Naqatullah, the Camel of God. It doesn't mean that the Camel is somehow intrinsic to God. It, it must be something that God possesses, or God has special affection for, or approval of. Uh, so if we say man of God, it doesn't mean that the man is somehow included in God. It means that God has some special affinity for this man or this man is aligning himself with the purposes of, 
of God. So nothing in the Quran actually leads to belief in the Trinity or the belief that uh, the Spirit uh, is somehow uh, a, a second divine person along with God. What about uh, statements in the Quran regarding Jesus uh, as the Word of God? Well, it may be that uh, as God creates by his creative command, saying kun, be, and then things become, because Jesus uh, in the Quranic uh, story resembles the biblical story in which uh, uh, Jesus is born without uh, a, a father, uh, this may be the reason why in the Quran it says that Jesus is given this special title, uh, Kalimatullah, or Kalimatim Min, he is a word from God. It does not mean the same as the Greek uh, concept of the Logos. The Greeks had the idea that God does not deal with the world directly, he has to deal through a mediator. Who is that mediator? His own reason. And so his own reason now are sometimes to say his wisdom. Now this becomes troubling in its own self because in the Bible we have in the Old Testament the mention of wisdom who is called Sophia but not called Logos. And Sophia is grammatically feminine. And Sophia speaks in the, in the book of Proverbs in chapter 8 in verse number 22 and says Yahweh created me. So that means wisdom is a, create, is a creature of Yahweh. And when Paul identifies Jesus with wisdom, it may mean that Paul thinks that Jesus is somehow a creature of, of Yahweh. So all of these are, are troubles for, are, and problems for the Christian doctrine, but I don't see that the, this is any problem uh, for the Muslim uh, conception. Now, uh, uh, Reverend Samuel, in his uh, uh, rebuttal, uh, just showed us a number of passages in which, uh, across the board, we can see all of the Gospels are in harmony. But on harmony on what? That Jesus is a teacher throughout. Okay, but we agree on that. Or Jesus is the Son of Man. Well, uh, first of all, you have to explain what is meant by Son of Man. And in Mark's Gospel, uh, Bruce Chilton has made the uh, observation that uh, whenever there is a mention of a futuristic Son of Man, it's not Jesus. It's someone else to come after Jesus. So in Mark's Gospel, again, we, we do not have the support for the Trinity uh, that some would like to find in the other Gospels, and, and they do seem to find more of in, in the other Gospels. As for the idea that Jesus is Lord in Mark's Gospel, uh, Reverend referred to Sam, uh, first, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse number 3. But if I read to you Mark chapter 1, verse number 3, you will see that this is not necessarily a, a Jesus being called Lord. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye for the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. I know Christians are thinking Jesus is coming, and we're going to prepare the way for the Lord, and then the Lord Jesus is going to walk on that path. But if it means Yahweh, it could be prepare the way of Yahweh uh, as Muslims would prepare let's say for Ramadan because Ramadan is coming it doesn't mean that Ramadan would actually walk in the past but you're cleaning up your house getting rid of evil things because you're going to welcome this uh, sacred month so if something special is going to happen for God here we're going to clear the way we're going to prepare the way for him to come uh, th this is an idea for God's special blessings to arrive through his envoy Jesus but again the title Lord is ambiguous and we have to see how it is being used in mark and how it is being used elsewhere and elsewhere it is used more with that divine uh, overture uh, when it's referring to Jesus so we see that development where it may have a simpler meaning in mark for example uh, on one occasion uh, Jesus is referred to as a teacher but in the same context in the same passage when we see it in Matthew and Luke he becomes Lord so you see, it goes from teacher to Lord. The evolution is very clear. It doesn't mean that every time there has to be an evolution, but there is an evolution enough times to make us aware that, yes, there is an evolution uh, in that uh, story and presentation. Now, according to Reverend uh, Samuel, all of the creeds mention the Holy Spirit. So that means all of the creeds are in agreement. No, sir. Uh, all of the creeds uh, would be in agreement if each one of them say that the, the if each one of them says that the Holy Spirit is God. But the fact is that the Apostles' Creed did not say that the Holy Spirit is God, uh, and the first Nicene Creed did not say that the Holy Spirit is God. It's only the later one that, that said this. So there is definitely an evolution where people are coming in, they're plugging the holes, they're putting the icing on the cake, uh, they, they are improving things as we go uh, over time. He, mentions Acts of the, uh, he mentioned Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 15, where Peter refers to Jesus as the author of life. Uh, there is metaphorical use in the Bible to be 
sure. And you cannot take something literally unless it's going to lead you to something that makes sense. First of all, we know that the author of life, if that refers to God himself, he cannot die. So it's senseless to say you kill the author of life. It's impossible. It cannot happen. So what, it must be an exaggerated way of, of, of Peter showing the irony of this situation by killing God's envoy. You have done something terrible here. You are introducing death where life actually uh, belongs. Uh, at the same time, it is not necessarily an authentic saying of Peter. This was written in Acts of the Apostles a long time after Peter had already uh, died. Uh, so, but even taking it as it is, uh, we do not have here sufficient uh, proof and verification of the doctrine of the Trinity as believed in by our Christian friends. And since the doctrine of the Trinity is so difficult to explain, which uh, Reverend Samuel said he will come back and do, uh, we should say that uh, rather we go back to the simple understanding that there is only one God, the God of the Old Testament, uh, who had a Holy Spirit, it's mentioned, but there is no idea that God is binitarian, that there is two persons in one God. God is just simply God, and there's a puzzle about the Holy Spirit. We don't know everything about God, but we know that there is only one God, and that's our proclamation tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shabir. And that will bring us to our further responses. So we'll have another five minutes. Do you need the computer? Yeah. So we have five minutes on the clock, please. Samuel? Thank you, Shabir. Now, I pointed out the difficulty that Tawheed has in regards to God becoming a what rather than a who and unknowable and being one with creation. And Shabir's answer to that, as far as I could hear, was just to say, yes, there may be difficulties, but we just concentrate on what God has revealed. Now, th this is that be la kefa, without asking how. So I I've put up the questions. I've said absolute oneness of God leads to all manner of difficulties. He hasn't explained any of those except just to say we don't go there. Well, please don't be critical of Christians. If the Islamic faith is based on we don't answer those questions, uh, you know, well then, please don't be critical of us. You were saying that the old, uh, the Trinity has evolved and it's not in Scripture, but I showed you that from the very first verse, the very second verse of the Bible, we see God's divine agent, the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. He speaks, he teaches throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Scriptures, and it comes to its fulfillment in the Gospel. So I showed that it's not that the Old Testament, the Jewish Scriptures teach, teach absolute oneness of God, absolute singularity, they have God with a unity and God with distinction. And this unity and distinction of the one God with his, the agents of his spirit and his image go throughout all the prophets. And as I've said, the reason I commend Christianity to you is that uh, Christianity is based on all the, all the books of the prophets. Christians don't just read one prophet, we read all of them. It seems to me that Islam and the Baha'i religion are very similar because in both of them there is one prophet who tells you what to believe about other people. Whereas for Christians, we have to read all the prophets. And I want to say that as a Christian, that's hard work. Having to read the Law of Moses, having to read the Psalms of David, having to read the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah, it's hard work for us to read all the prophets. But these books build on each other, and they're meant to be read together, and so that's what we do. Now, he said, when I posed the question of that you will see Allah on the last day, and that this is a type of incarnation, Shabir said, well, you, you will have different types of eyes. But that doesn't matter because it's still going to be in temporal creation. Within creation, there will be an, a representation of Allah. You will see him. And I'm saying that that is a type of incarnation that you need to explain. To say that the, uh, it, um, re regarding the Holy Spirit in the Quran, the way that I did my research was to, uh, and I read some Arabic, uh, I... I'm working my way through the grammar and I've almost finished. But the way that I do it is I get a concordance and I look up every reference to that word in the Arabic language and I follow it through. And I see that Allah breathes out his spirit. He breathes out his breath. He breathes out his spirit. It's, it's called his Ru. And then we see that the Ru of Allah comes to Mary as a man. And so that's what I'm asking. So I'm asking him to explain. Again, to, to say that Jesus is a word of God does not uh, really make sense because... Everyone, all of us here are a word of God because we're all made from God's command. So it doesn't, it's not a unique title. 
There's no use calling Jesus a word from God when, when that's common to all of us. No, the only reason a word of God makes sense is when you take in the Trinitarian sense. That that is, it's a statement about being, uh, Jesus being one with God, about monotheism, and of him having a distinct personhood. Uh, Paul, when he speaks of Jesus as the wisdom of God, he's not referring back to, I think it's Proverbs 8. It's a different reference there that he's doing in 1 Corinthians, uh, tw uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but I haven't got time for that now. Um, to say that, again, the Gospels are evolving, I showed that that's not the case, because I showed that in Mark's Gospel, which is seen to be the earliest one, you have... Uh, you have Jesus saying there is one God, but then the very next story is where he says, and I sit at God's right hand at his divine son. So the Gospel of Mark has a high Christology from the very beginning. Again with the creeds, I'd say, that, I'd just go back to what I said, that the creeds unpack themselves. And I'd invite you to just have a look at them, because from the very beginning there is the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the only Son. And then the other creeds unpack this. But again, I want to finish up by saying, it can, it can appear to Christians that it, there's a problem because we've got these synoptic differences between these different accounts of Jesus. I'm glad they're there because, as I said, early in Islam's history, there were synoptic Qurans. And they had differences within the verses, which you can read about. I've got a booklet on the subject, which I can give you on this topic. And there were differences in their emphasis on different verses. One, verse was, uh, one collection was made the standard one, and the other synoptic Qurans were not included and were ultimately burned by Uthman. And I think Christians are better off for having kept all of the synoptic gospels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samuel. Dr. Shabir. So in this final um, uh, rebuttal, let me make these points. First, uh, the Muslim saying Bila Kaif without knowing how is regarding mysteries about God which are common to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In fact, in a paper that Reverend Samuel himself wrote, this is common to world philosophies and, and religions more generally. So, I mean, if we talk about the, uh, the relationship between God's essence and his attributes, these are universal problems. But the specific problem introduced by Christianity is the claim that one of the attributes of God became a man. The logos of God, his reason, became a man. And he has his own logos and reason, obviously, because Jesus has to have the same thing that the Father has, uh, and the same powers and abilities and rationality and so on. So he has attributes too. So can one of his attributes also become God? And now would we have like the Trinity being expanded into a multiplicity? Uh, so that's the problem that we have to deal with. It's not the, the Muslim saying Bila Kaif for those uh, universal problems, but it's the specific uh, claims of Christianity that need to be justified. Uh, but to justify his claim, uh, uh, Reverend Samuel said that, well, in, even in the Gospel according to Mark, Jesus forgives sins. But he could be doing so as a prophet. And in fact, when we read Matthew together with Mark, we realize that this is what is happening because the people on that occasion praised God for giving such authority to men. That means that Jesus was not the only one to have that sort of authority to declare to a person that his sins are forgiven. Men can have that authority. They're not gods. They're human beings, but agents and envoys of God, which Muslims believe that Jesus uh, was one of. As for the Spirit of God in, uh, mentioned in the Old Testament, according to James Charlesworth in his book, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, there is no mention in the Old Testament of the Spirit of God in the sense in which Christians have taken the Spirit to be, like a, sec a third person of the Holy Trinity. Yes, there is something ambiguous about the mention of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament, but you cannot turn the ambiguity into a greater problem. And in fact, to say that God is three in one is a greater problem that is very difficult to explain. And Samuel hasn't actually explained how it could be so. How can you have the Father as God, the Son as God, the Holy Spirit as God, and it's still one God? Because it's looking to me like three. And maybe somebody has a good explanation to show that they're actually one, but uh, Samuel hasn't given us that in, uh, explanation. Instead, he has said, well, okay, you Muslims have your problems too. But as I've said, the problems that we're dealing with on the Muslim side are the kinds of universal problems of a lesser degree we're not saying that one of the attributes of God became a, a man. He says, well, Islam is like Baha'ism and, uh, you know, and Judaism together. They, they have some things in common, but much, indif much difference. But uh, at least we unite on the very important uh, uh, principle that there is only one God. And, and this is called in the, uh, in the New Testament itself, on the lips of Jesus, the greatest commandment. 
So, and in fact, it's the first principle. When we talk about religion, we want to know, is there a God? And if there is a God, who exactly is he or she? We want to know who is God. So is God one or is he a trinity? And uh, of course, Muslims and Jews are united on that point. Uh, Reverend Samuel spoke about the unity of the, of the books of the Bible. Uh, but in fact, we, we have seen examples showing that they're in fact disunited. The New Testament promotes Jesus to be God. And in the Old Testament, God is not a man and cannot be a man. Numbers chapter 23, verse number 19. 19 makes that very clear. God is not a man. So how does he become a man I, I, later on in Christian thinking? I, among the Gospels, we have seen that there is a development and evolution of the ideas. He says that there is none. But think about the Gospel according to John referring to Jesus as the Logos. No other Gospel does that. So there is a development. There is a change. Which other Gospel calls Jesus the only begotten Son of God? None of them do, except John's Gospel. There is certainly a development. And uh, Mark calling Jesus the Son of Man, who sits uh, at the right hand of God? Uh, well, uh, no, I beg to differ, Reverend, because according to Bruce Chilton, whom I mentioned previously, this is a reference to someone to come after Jesus. It's not to, to Jesus himself, not in Mark's gospel. So obviously, in Mark's gospel, you do not have the, the, the ready-made uh, proof text to support the Trinity. Uh, you will find such proof texts uh, more likely in other gospels, but even those fall short because the Trinity is a later idea. The Apostles' Creed, yes, it mentions that Jesus is the only Son, but it doesn't mention that he is the second person of the Holy Trinity. It doesn't mention that he is actually God. That comes later. Uh, it, it's later on that the Holy, that the Son is said to be true God of true God. That is in the first Nicene Creed. And then in the second Nicene Creed, add the Holy Spirit. Now you have three. Now you have the complete uh, Trinity. So it is definitely an evolved idea that does not make sense. Let's go back to what makes sense, which is the original proclamation that there is only one God. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, audience. And thank you, kids, children, young ones, for being so quiet at the, throughout this dialogue. We really appreciate that.